Welcome to the English Web, the electronic newsletter of the English department here at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Uh, I am Luke Mancuso, a faculty member here in the English department at St. John's. And today we are delighted to welcome uh, three of our graduating seniors from the class of 2013 who will be commencing in approximately 12 days. <laughs> So uh, it is imminent indeed. Uh, so before they leave, we would like to uh, take a walk down memory lane with them uh, in relationship to some of the pivotal experiences uh, that they have had um, enrolled in English courses here in the department, as well as their larger uh, commitments uh, in the local campus community and beyond. Uh, so I'd like for you, first of all, to introduce yourself. Uh, to uh, our viewers, and I'd like for you to recommend a, a book and tell us why you would recommend it, and then uh, a film, because you know that that's what I do. <laughs> so Tyler, we'll start with you. Okay, my name is Tyler Speltz, a graduating senior, obviously. I come from Winona, Minnesota, and uh, a book I would recommend would be Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses, um, because his his metaphorical images are so dark, but yet you want to like jump into the page with them. And a film I would recommend is um, from 2009 called An Education, starting, starring Carrie Mulligan. Um, it's a classic feminist work. Um, an absolutely brilliant film. Great. Alrighty, uh, hey, I'm uh, Matt. <laughs> if I had to recommend, um, I'm gonna go with a movie first because I haven't decided on a book yet. Um, if I had to go with one movie, I would say probably Melancholia by Lars von Trier, <laughs> just because it's beautiful and brilliant and makes you question your mortality, which is always a very fun experience. <laughs> um, huh. If I had to do one book, I guess the book that probably had the most impact on me was Absalom, Absalom, so I suppose I would have to go with that one, just because it's really great. I don't know, I can't really think of a way to describe it without just talking about how really perfect it is as a novel, in my opinion. Faulkner was pretty good. He was. I agree. And my name is Will Moore. I'm from St. Cloud, Minnesota. And if I had to pick a book, it would be uh, one that's fresh in my mind right now for my capstone class, which is A Lesson Before Dying. Wow. Uh, it takes place in the 1940s in Louisiana, and it examines humanity and race and religion and all sorts of things all cum culminating together. Uh, and my film recommendation would be Babel, which is a very interesting film starring uh, Kate Blanchett and uh, Brad Pitt. Uh, it takes place in four different parts of the world in four or five different languages and really just changes your view of a global society that we're in right now. Wow. Uh, these are very thoughtful people, as you can tell. <laughs> now, um, I'd like for you to think back. When did you know that you were going to focus on English? I mean, did you come here with this sort of drive because of the pleasure you had as an ingrained reader from childhood? Did you have a conversion experience? Were you standing um, in the student commons and suddenly it was a bolt of lightning that struck you? Um, or was it a gradual awakening in some way? Can you talk about that in some specific mm -hmm. or concrete mm -hmm. way, Tyler? <clears throat> My senior year of high school, we read The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, and our, our English teacher brought us to one particular line where O'Brien references that old lie, which is an allusion to the poem Dolce et Decorum Est. And if you kind of weren't inside and you didn't know that, you probably wouldn't pick up on it. I wouldn't have as a senior, but he brought that to my, intent, my attention. And from that point on, I started to realize how interconnected um, and how much information is packed into the things we watch and the things we read. And so that started a, a very gradual unfolding. And then when I took my first class, um, which is reading poetry with Mike Opitz, uh, some of the, the theoretical analyses that he, he taught us to do very, very s slowly awakened me to the process, a process that I myself can engage in to understand the world. And 
ever since then, it's, it's just been the only thing I, I really want to do. So the pivotal experience was really Mike's poetry. Really. Yeah, that, that solidified the, the first experience from my senior year of high school. As, as soon as that happened, then I knew there was no going back. All right. uh, clearly a lot of satisfaction there mm -hmm. in that. Mine was similar. I started in high school. My junior year, we read, um, I can't remember the name of it, escapes me, but we read this one book. It had a really big impact on me, and I talked to the teacher a lot about it, and I just kind of started liking what he did as a job and thought maybe I'd like to do it too. Then when I came here, I was sort of the, you know, get by with Bs, not really work that hard students, and I, my first class for English was with uh, Christina Schaus Torino. And she kicked my ass in terms of <laughs> writing and interpretation and made me actually work uh, very, very hard at writing and reading and critical thought and all that. So that was kind of what solidified it for me because once you start doing that, you start loving it and you can't really not do it. Like I can't not, I can't read a book or watch a movie without doing stuff like that now. And it's it's been really, really fun kind of watching me grow as an adult as long while my skills of reading and writing have also so been Christina growing. So Christina sort of helped you sort of uh, in some way harness this love you had, kind of intuitive love for literature, uh, and show you that part of the pleasure is the discipline of reading down, reading carefully, yeah. uh, and articulating that, which of course is why we're here. Uh, Will? Um, I kind of knew... I didn't declare until sophomore year, but I kind of knew what I was going to get into uh, even before that because uh, English classes were definitely my favorite in high school. Uh, the kind of quintessential love it or hate it high school novel, Catcher in the Rye, was uh, <laughs> probably the one that did it for me in high school, and I was in the love it camp. Uh, and then we came hate here. <laughs> Tyler doesn't agree with me, see, illustrating I, I, my I, point. I also hated it. <laughs> Well, see, that's the other thing. It creates discussion <laughs> of about does. different works of literature. That's what we do, indeed. Um, anyway, uh, so that was kind of my uh, thought coming in, but I didn't really realize that I'd made the correct decision until I took Lit Theory, which was actually in your class. <laughs> um, and after that, it was like Matt said, you know, it becomes, you keep seeing all these different films and works of literature through these lenses, and it's something you can't turn off but I don't really want to because it's actually opened my experience with it and it's not detracting from just the enjoyment of the plot either. It's, it, this is really remarkable. I mean, what we, what we promise to give our majors or prospective majors is the pleasure of being able to read complex texts and authorize your own meanings. In other words, rather than just passively consuming a film or a book or a, an image or a media product or a, a social antagonism or conflict, you can produce and authorize a specific concrete perspective on that, uh, on that text. So you've already begun to sort of talk about pivotal moments of being here where you found yourself in a new relationship to the pleasure of reading um, critically reading um, with more than just a kind of naive enthusiasm. Uh, can you remember back to one of the first English courses um, where you encountered a text that was either really complex and too perplexing but worked toward that? Um, or can you think of a text where you suddenly had the pleasure of going, oh, I can do this? Tyler? In 243, first semester of my sophomore year, I, I recently went back and looked at all the papers I wrote for you. Luke. This is literary theory. Yes, <laughs> lit theory. So I went back and looked at all of my, my criticisms, and um, the first three of them were absolutely horrible. And I, I know now why I didn't get you know good grades. My deconstruction was poor. Um, my psychoanalysis, I mean, that was way over it wasn't my head. Poor Tyler, I remember it was good. <laughs> it was well. Regardless, though, and, and then I... W you were striving for excellence. Psychoanalysis went over your head? <laughs> Back then it did, yes. That didn't... But anyway... Not anymore. <laughs> the, the, the very, um, my very first successful reading was of a short story by George Saunders called My Flamboyant Grandson. And the queer theory criticism I did of that story, to this day I still think, is one of the best things I've ever written. And so unlocking... Um, a, a deeper layer in the dialogue between this uh, this man and his grandson who is 
gay. Um, I, I saw not just what they were saying, but what was what they were being pushed to say by the context they were in. Exactly. And so I, you know, I, I started to peel back the layers, and that was the very first, like, really successful reading of a text that I did. And that was very satisfying, wasn't it? OMG. I still look back on it. Right, but, right because, you know, what queer theory does is ask, get, raise questions about normalization. I mean, <laughs> why do we make normalizing judgments, and what kinds of exclusion or inclusion do they mm -hmm. um, commit in the in the real world, uh, Matt? All right, I remembered what the book in high school was. It was the great essays, also uh, poetry or uh, fictional prose. Um, all of those imaginative forms are also committed uh, writing. Can you talk about um, writing now in a different way than you could say three or four years ago, Tyler? Oh, absolutely. Um, I took 311 with Christina Schaus Torino, and um, this is all going to go back to Zizek always says destitution is the, is the site of revolution. <laughs> and and I, I, I. There is the Zizek reference. She brought me down to writing destitution, from which I, I have since grown, where the very first essay I wrote in our small groups just got torn apart, and Matt was actually there for that, where I thought I had written this exemplary essay, and, and I, I threw together, you know, what I thought were these great lines and images, but as a paper, it didn't cohere. I mean, hardly in the slightest, and I had to, I had to tear it apart myself and, and, um, and completely rebuild the whole thing. And from that, that first experience in 311 last year, I've, um, my writing has completely changed in, in terms of being able to think about a whole piece of work coheres and how, you know, and not, not you know, losing a paper in, images and metaphors, but, you know, making them all connect and line up. Which component of that experience for you was the pivot which allowed you to open the door more? Was it the fact that you were willing to take feedback mm -hmm. in a yes. kind of constructive environment or? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I mean, my, my first thought was what anybody would think you know that you know are they you know is this against me personally and right. and and you know and I looked how, at how can they do this <laughs> yes and and then they they all I put my heart and soul in this <laughs> they all looked at me with smiles as they were saying this and not not in an antagonistic way but in in a, I mean supportingly smiling at me right. and so then I I had to, I had to trust them in order to accept the right. criticism and and I did trust them and I I accepted it and and um, from there I was able to you know not just let their criticism stand, but agree with that, and then criticize my own work and build there. Well, until you enter a piece of writing into a community of readers, mm -hmm. into a workshop of some kind, it's going to lie inert on the page. Mm -hmm. It's only the living response of other voices and so forth. Did, were you able to also like reciprocate this process for others in the class? To help them to like arrive at moments where they could take an impasse and move beyond it and so forth. That was something that took practice, just like because I mean I didn't you know write the most coherent paper and then everyone after that went perfectly. I mean it, it was a a really cyclical process, and I think you know working with the same five people all semester, we all grew into each other's each right. other's rhythm. Voices. So, you know at first you know I, I picked up okay well you know I don't I don't know if I like how you phrase this. Let's change this and then okay and then I started to to see how other people's papers cohere as fully functioning larger work. Okay, if you were to if you were to like sum up your own writerly voice in say one sentence, how would you describe your voice in My a piece voice? of any in any piece of committed writing? Whether it has footnotes or whether it's a creative piece or an essay. My voice is inexorably attached to the agricultural environment I grew up on. It's, I, I, I prefer a straightforward, raw, kind of unbuttered, um, but not harsh voice. So in other words, you want to represent the kind of material environment in which the mm -hmm. subject you're writing about finds him or herself. I think so. Maybe with some colloquialisms thrown in. Oh, yes. I, I, yes. You know, and that, you know, and, um, yeah, so part of, I guess, talking about agriculture, it's not, um, it's not purely being raw, but also, I guess, uh, 
I have reservations against using overly academic voice. I like producing accessible works. We call that jargon, jargon. in the business. <laughs> yes. And it's no longer smiled upon, even mm -hmm. among mm -hmm. professional yes. academic writing so um, writers. Uh, so jargon is now sort of anathema. So you're, you're very much on board. Uh, Matt? Uh, for me, it would also have to be in 311, which Tyler was in and Will was in as well. You were in the same class? Yeah, all three, all three of us, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Tyler and I were in the same group that would like edit each other's papers. I don't think you were I was in not. our group. Yeah. Um, your stuff was good too, though, <laughs> when you read it to us. Um, for me, that class was interesting because the very first one we did, I basically just wrote, you know, what I thought about something, and it turned out fairly well, and I didn't really have to change it that much, and I got a good grade on it. So I was like, hey, I must be great at writing. And then <laughs> the second one comes along, and it's a little more structured, and then that one I had to change a lot more and work a lot more on, mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of find my voice again, really, because I, I felt really constrained by all the stuff in there. So I had to learn to work within sort of guidelines in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and just my, I've never written more in my life than I have for that one class. It was amazing and it was fun. I really miss that class sometimes, especially now that I don't have any English courses this semester except for film. Right, you. right. But I, yeah, so I really miss that aspect of it. Um, yeah. The bonding obviously is really important in terms of, because all of you were mentioning this, that when you create a community of readers and a community of feedback, um, it really does shape <laughs> what the words that finally appear on the page and so forth. Um, can you say a word about revision, Matt? I mean, was that a, an arduous process? Was it a pleasurable? Was it all of the above? For me, at first, it was really, really arduous, and I absolutely hated it because, like I said, I came from the tradition of, you know, just write one thing, and if, if and it's, it's fairly good. If you get an A or a B, that's fine. You don't really ever read through it again. I never really... Returned again and again. Yeah, honestly, I had never revised a single one of my papers before I was in that class. Wow. I had just turned them all in as was. Right. Uh, so the, for me, that was a really odd habit to get into and it was also really really shocking to read what I had written because when I encountered something I didn't like I my first response was to admonish myself for writing it in the first place right. it's just I didn't realize how much my own interpretation of an event could change right. like over the course of a few days between when I wrote it the first time and then when I thought about it a few right. days later right. so that was a lot of fun what I actually, love what I end. love about revision is that it's unending as, as our legendary sister Mara Faulkner will tell you, uh, a piece of writing is never actually done. And that's part, I think, of the kind of inexhaustible, both uh, reverence we have for language, but also the wrestling match <laughs> that we engage in because we take it so seriously. Uh, will? Uh, I was also in the 311 class that they spoke of, but mine was more of like a two-step process. I took a creative writing class, sophomore year with Mike Opitz, and uh, if anything else, he can really get you excited about writing. Oh, my God. Uh, he is he will, a magician. He is. <laughs> he will love it and be passionate about it. Indeed. And we, we did group revisions and readings there, too. And that was all helpful and good. And we were able to do things publicly, which I think is important. Uh, live readings can really change the way that you view or read a piece. Um, and then in Christina's class, uh, that everything just went into overdrive there. It was a much more intimate group. She was there the entire time giving her opinions in, and that was really the next step, and that made me realize that um, that sort of sharing aspect with the people who will be your audience, that is essential. And it was through that process that I actually achieved in that class the only paper I've ever gotten a perfect score on my entire time here. Wow. So It was a phenomenal essay. <laughs> Still have it, and 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 I still have it on my computer. I have notes all over it, making changes still. <laughs> uh, that's it's because it's not later. done. It's, yeah. even though it's perfect, it's not exactly done. like you just said. <laughs> uh, yeah, which is interesting. Wow. So, if you were to um, articulate some of the sort of satisfactions that you're um, cataloging and narrating now that you think every 
incoming English major should experience while they're here. Can you name three concrete components of your experience as an English major that should be universalized? Um, every English major should A, B, C. <laughs> um, Tyler? Well, that's very difficult. Um, every English major should read a complex text coming in and fail to understand it, and then read it again as a senior and pick up on it. So in other words, come back. Yes. You, you have to return to stuff. And for me, a good example of that is Annie Proust's Brokeback Mountain, which we read in your 243. Right. And, and I, I enjoyed that text, but I, I, didn't, I, I didn't have the ability to get everything out of it that I do now. And for, I mean, literature by women with um, Sister Mara right now. And I, I went and I read the whole collection that that's in Wyoming stories and every story. I'm I mean, so envious. Just, just <laughs> every story knocked me over. And, and I, you know, and I could perform like an unending like dialogue or analysis with the stories um, that I, I couldn't have done then. Um, so to what do you attribute this newfound sort of reservoir of critical practice? Uh, every, every English class has given me a chance, has brought new things to me, but also given me a venue to practice the same skills over and over um, of analysis and critical thinking. Um, okay, so that's one. So come back to a text that you encountered at the opening of the road, yes. Yes. at the finish line, mm -hmm. and you will experience it as though mm -hmm. it were a, a rich and inviting continent of possibilities. A second thing every English major should do is take poetry seriously. Like actually try and write, seri um, not serious poetry, but seriously write poetry. Um, I, I, I go on and off the map where sometimes, you know, I, I really, have an affinity for poetry, and then sometimes I just don't care for it. And I, in creative writing right now with Sister Mara, and obviously, you know, she really is so inviting to her students about everything that she teaches. And um, we were talking about finding a voice before, and, and I think my voice is coming through most strongly right now as it ever has in the poetry that I'm writing. So mm -hmm. every English major should take poetry very seriously, you know, try, at least for a little a little short time, because um, normally liking theory, I'm not, you know, I, I don't do a lot of it, but um, it's worth my time to take it very seriously. So specific. expanding the various languages that you speak, yes, uh, because theory is one sort of mm -hmm. inflection, but yes. poetry is another one. As Zizek says, uh, poetry is the torture house of language that we use to force language to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And Sister Mara lives by that, yes. and you know that. Yes. Okay, and a third component? Oh, Lord. Um, every English major should take film theory. Okay, can you give a rationale for that? <laughs> yes, because um, it's... Why? I mean, I, I understand, okay. because everyone wants to take it. Yes. Is it the language? Is it the medium of it's, film? It is, is it? it is the medium of film, because it, you know, it's one thing to understand that you know, books are a place to engage in, in critical thinking, but movies carry a stigma of, like, passive consumption. And, I mean, you stop that dead in its tracks, I think, for every student that walks into your film class. Um, you try so, anyway. I mean, so, so it seems to me that what you're saying is take film theory because you will encounter the pleasures of producing exciting possibilities as opposed to just sitting in front of a mm -hmm. TV with a remote control. It, I mean, it, 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 it's like, you know, all English majors through literature drive down a certain road and, you know, we look at movies as another road and say, you know, we don't want to drive there and then you make us turn right and go down that <laughs> road. And it, it, you know, you open up a whole new avenue of, of text to read. Now, well, film is the universal language now. I mean, not everyone uh, is a lucky enough mortal to read Shakespeare anymore, mm -hmm. uh, but everyone. Mm -hmm. speaks filmic language at yes. some level. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, Matt, what are, what are some of the components that you would say require or mandate for English students? The first one would have to be something that I didn't actually learn in, in English, but I learned applied to English afterward. Um, I started um, 
working out a lot and then I quickly learned through some other friends of mine, check your ego at the door because if you don't, you're going to put too much weight on something and hurt yourself and it's going to be embarrassing and painful and emasculating and all that. And the same thing happens with English. I came into English thinking that I had a pretty good grasp of everything and that there really wasn't a lot for me to learn in certain instances and I, yeah, I kind of hate that I thought that. Uh, but it's it's really you learn a lot and you are humbled a lot if you really put some effort into it So check your ego at the door. You're not as good a writer as you think you're not as good at interpreting th as interpreting things as you think and If you th and if you do think that way you won't learn as much. So be open to learning. Yeah, basically yeah. Um, Second one This is hard <laughs> <laughs> I have an advantage here because I have more time to think about it. Now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, yeah. Would you recommend that students take a specific writing course, like writing essays, or should they take a certain um, strand of literary studies? Should they still be required to take a kind of theoretical introduction? Should they be required to take film studies? Um, they should take all of them, but um, I, I came up with two other ones there. Um, one of them was, another thing is don't neglect classes outside of English, because a lot of the stuff I learned about writing philosophy and theory, I learned in some philosophy courses right. I had. I learned about writing politics and intro to poli-sci. I took a history course where I learned how to write historical narratives. Mm -hmm. It's You can learn a lot from a lot of different things, and you can all apply it into English. So definitely don't get into that you know habit of being an English major and yeah, I'm an English major, I'm smarter than all you because I read books right, and that whole right, thing. It's, right. uh, everything has something to offer and you can mash them all together and make something pretty cool. Right. And then as for theory, that would be my third one is I really fell in love with critical theory. Mm. Um, I loved, I took it with Mike Opitz. We read Structuralism and Post-Structuralism for Beginners. I love that little book. I still have it. <laughs> I still read it once in a while. Um, Binary it, oppositions and so forth. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> yeah, it just intru it introduced me to Derrida and Foucault and um, through Lacan, Zizek, and a lot of other people sure. that I just love talking about and reading about now. Like I follow Zizek on whenever he writes on the Huffington Post. It's just, <laughs> it's really interesting and entertaining. <laughs> yeah, and, and also the connection to film there through Zizek is indeed, pretty cool. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Like he wrote something on Zero Dark Thirty a few weeks ago. He did indeed. It, yeah. It's a very compelling reading of the film as well. And yeah. apparently infuriated uh, Catherine Bigelow, the director, mm -hmm. uh, because it's an excoriating review. But um, so my, I always tell students on the first day of theory class that theory is um, an invitation to think strangely about the social identity that you project into your commitments, politics, sense of identity in terms of gender, in terms of sexual difference, in terms of sexuality, in terms of race, in terms of economic um, or cultural class and so forth. And all of you are actually talking about those things in some really uh, textured ways. Uh, Matt, how would you define theory in a phrase or two? What has it done for you that you, or what do you think it can do for students? Uh, for me personally, it's allowed me to create a language and I guess jargon. Which I disagree. I love jargon. I think there should be more. I think there should be more of jargon from all over the place and everything. Jargon is learn fun if you're an yeah. insider. Exactly. Yeah. But, and if not, then you get to learn something. So that's Indeed. fun. But it's allowed me to put into words a lot of those weird, absurd, ridiculous, um, amorphous thoughts that you have in your own head about something when you observe something and you think stuff about it, but you can't really explain what it is. Mm -hmm. For me, theory has helped to make sense of kind of the, um, the human's natural ability to interpret things. And mm -hmm. it's allowed me to put that into words. Thank so it, it's helped me to make sense of the world, I guess. Thank you so much. That's, uh, that's very compelling. Uh, Will? If I could just make a comment on that before please, I start my please. three. Uh, the way I've always viewed theory is kind of like one of those big things that the eye doctor has at his office that you put over your eyes and he goes through different lenses and you have to choose number one or two. Right. Yes. It's like that. Right. It gives you all these different 
ways of looking at the same you know screen in his in that case right. it's exactly. you're looking at a bunch of letters and I guess right. that's what you're doing here too. Uh, that's just Mara's definition of theory, putting on different lenses mm -hmm. and so forth as well, yes. Yeah, and it's just, you'd be amazed at what you find. It's different every time. Indeed. Uh, for the three ideas that English majors should have, number one is just an organizational thing where if you have an idea, write it down immediately or you're going to forget it. Um, whether that's, that, especially with like creative writing, if you have an idea like this would be such a good idea for a short story or a poem or something, uh, get it out of your head as much as you can immediately. It's almost like a cathartic experience after a while. So carry a notebook or have a yeah. dexterity with your thumbs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't, don't be like afraid that oh, I'm going to look socially weird just doing this, writing off right. my own little thing because right. it'll be, you'll thank yourself later. Uh, number two is uh, always question everything whenever you consume any sort of media. Uh, it can be a film, it can be a book, it can be a popular song, whatever. You can like enjoy it and really get a lot out of it, but then go back and think, okay, what is really going on here? Like shine like a diamond, for example. <laughs> shine like a diamond. <laughs> the popular song by Rihanna and so forth. I was talking about that in class the other day. Um, I mean, raising questions produces pleasure for you and did you learn how to do that better here in some way? Or? Oh, absolutely. It was the, it goes back to the, the 243, the lit theory class where um, it became something that I would became actively looking at in everything. Uh, not just stuff for school, but just leisurely things. Mm -hmm. uh, hanging out with my friends. Uh, I remember when I was abroad in Italy, I went to go see Skyfall in a Roman theater. <laughs> And I was sitting there, and I kept on thinking, of like, man, I could do a paper on just, like, the Foucault, like, right. sort of, uh, the ways they're, like, handling the law, or even, like, some sort of queer theory with this. And it was, it was literally something I couldn't turn off. I hadn't had theory. I was nowhere near St. John's or any English class, and I was still doing it. Uh, it's a reflex. Yeah, it becomes just natural. Uh, and then the third thing is uh, don't be, don't have an, a phobia of editing. If we oh. get the uh, the papers back, the red ink on the paper, it's almost mm -hmm. like an aversion. But uh, if you if you do it, it's always always worth it. It's not. It may you may think like, oh, if I go through this, I'm just going to feel like a terrible writer. But this is how you get better, mm -hmm. and then you will get better. It's like. Uh, it's like a necessary evil almost in a way right. of, you know, you have these ideas initially and you think they're perfect, mm -hmm. but you need to put, put yourself through a little pain and swallow your pride a bit to get better. It requires a commitment mm -hmm. and a sustained commitment over longer stretches of time mm -hmm. to produce that kind of reflexive pleasure of going, oh, here is a nugget of insight and so forth. There it is, right? Whoomp, there it is, and so forth. I mean, so I think that's part of what we at least commit ourselves uh, to give you. Now, the, the motto of our department, as you may know on the webpage, is choose your own adventure. So, yes, can you describe some of the ways that English um, has either shaped or um, influenced? or in some way um, colored your larger experience here on campus? Um, has it produced uh, opportunities for creating networks or certain kinds of relationships on campus? Um, has it given you opportunities to use your uh, higher honed communication skills? What, were some, what are some of the pleasures or challenges of being an English major on campus? You first asked how the English majors has affected our overall larger experience. I mean, I haven't taken only English classes, but if you ask any of my friends, all of them will tell you, I mean, like theory and English, and it, it, it con constitutes 90% of what, what I talk about. Um, <laughs> the other 10% is farming. The other 10% <laughs> is literally farming. Um, in th uh, writing essays, English 311, I 
found a very strong desire that I, I didn't foresee myself getting. I came to St. John's thinking I would leave the farm, never go back. Um, I've lived my life there, now I go start a new life somewhere else. And in 311 I found this desire in me to, to, to create some kind of bridge between the academic and the rural, the agricultural. Mm -hmm. And I've found that bridge to be through um, sustainability or sustainable farming, organic farming. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess that so it, uh, that new well my choosing that adventure I guess has tainted my not tainted has um, in the best possible way contaminated than everything <laughs> since then that I've done with English right it hasn't made me want to walk away with English but it's given a certain color to um, my goals mm -hmm. with my with my major mm -hmm. And at the same time, my major has completely recoiled back on, on everything in my life um, about, you know, how do I read my own decisions and, the, you know, the, the, the things I consume that cause me to choose what I do. Right, and, right. It's, and it's given me a certain authority over all that. Right. And um, it's, it's, it's given me a very specific picture of the future I want and I know why I want it. Well, you know, I mean, English, I mean, if, if language is the, uh, various languages are the, is the medium we're talking about, this is your life in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some way, unlike accountants, for example, perhaps you will be able to use your major every day mm -hmm. in the future, in the sense of being a vehicle for forms of uh, engagement, communication, mm -hmm. intervention, and so forth. That's what I'm hoping for. Uh, Matt? Um, can you um, uh, describe the ways that being an English major has in some way shaped um, your larger experience on campus? Uh, yeah. Um, first off, I think it would have to do with, well, there are two main things that shaped with me on campus a lot. The, the first is my own kind of personal, emotional, psychological well-being, whatever. And the second would be... <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and, and the se and the second would be my uh, minor, which is secondary education. Right. Um, English has just helped me more than anything else with um, learning how to teach. Um, we we go on a lot of practicums, and it really really helps that I've read so much and interpreted so much and thought so much about certain things that I can then use with other students, and it's the best feeling in the world when you're mm -hmm. talking to a high schooler or a middle schooler and you're um, expressing some of the ideas that you've learned in these kind of, you know, tricky ways where they kind of get to the conclusion all on their own and it's just watching them learn is just the greatest thing ever. So in, in a way, English has helped me um, find what I love to do. So that's one thing that's, I suppose, the purpose of why I'm here at college is to find that. Indeed. Um, and then the second with emotional well-being, going back to writing essays again, one of the essays I wrote um, in that class, the second one that we wrote actually, um, was me, essentially it boiled down to me describing how I felt about meeting someone who, um, with whom I proceeded to fall in love and still am in love with and am still together with. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and I wrote it in such a way that it was all very, very ambiguous. Um, just for the sake of you know frustrating the listener or the reader, but right. in writing it, it really helped me come to terms with my own feelings a lot. Clarification, so, right? Yeah, and so I think that I would not be half as emotionally or psychologically literate as I am today if it weren't for English. So, in some way, translating a sort of emotional, uh, pivotal experiences into language gives you a kind of authority in relationship to narrating those, creating kind of distance, but also allowing others the pleasure of witnessing how to go about confronting these, these experiences, which are intensely private in general and so yeah. forth, right? Yeah, definitely. Like, I didn't share that with the class originally. Right. Um, I just pretended like I wrote a story. Right. Um, but then also, what you were saying there about how language allows us to express all this stuff, also keeping in mind, you, you don't want to lose that kind of playful sense right. of it. Like you want to keep in mind that language is just our attempt to create an interpretation of this reality that we honestly know nothing about and can't Absolutely. ever describe on its own. So, you know, so it's, um, I can't remember who said it, one theorist talked about dialogue of, with the absurd. Right. 
it's kind of, for me, English has also been a lot about that. This, at the same time as I'm coming to terms with all this stuff and describing it and learning so much through that, there's also in the back of my mind this idea of this is just my interpretation. This isn't actually objectively true. And that's so much fun for me. Right. Because it has, it has authority as an interpretation. Yeah. And it can compel others to think in a certain, with a certain angle about that particular uh, event or text um, and so forth. And Zizek says that he thinks reality exists so that we can speculate about it. <laughs> so he more or yeah. less is reiterating what you just said. Uh, yeah. Will? Um, first of all, uh, the absurd, that was, was that Albert Camus? Yeah, he's the one who did the whole absurdism mm -hmm. thing. I can't remember who talked about dialogue with the absurd. It might have been Foucault. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree that uh, English. It's kind of when we first get accepted in major, like oh, it's the, it's the most uh, widely uh, used, or it gives you the most options for a future career or something. Uh, and at least on campus, it has really applied to other fields of study. I'm a music minor. Okay. And so, what is your instrument? Uh, bass. Wow. And. Uh, so these are, writing and music are both forms of expression that can change over time. And uh, they, throughout my classes, they're amazingly parallel to each other. Uh, we're getting back to like, I remember from uh, Ozzy's linguistic class talking about Middle English and Old English and really going back to like medieval music when like the first modes and scales were first being designed. Uh, and then going into later forms like Romanticism, we talk about romantic poets and the focus on emotion. And then you listen to a romantic symphony or something, and it sounds exactly right. like that in a sonic form. It's just, right. it's amazing how these schools of thought and these just kind of underlying themes can apply so much in different forms of art and then that can contribute to our larger history. Right. And that is something I still find so interesting today, just like uh, what my paper is right now in Capstone, I'm talking about how something can be described as, this is so 80s, this is so 90s. How do we do that? It's through these <laughs> mediums. <laughs> Students, yes, they completely um, sort of puzzle me when they do that, because those seem so recent. <laughs> Yeah, and we didn't. We weren't even alive for most of these. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's just you start finding these threads and these veins of different things uh, throughout the past and things that trends that continue through the future. And then another thing uh, that the English majors helped me on campus. This is going to be really cheesy, but just a group of friends because uh, every day in class we're doing discussions. We're seeing each other's creative works and seeing the inner workings of each other's minds and then you really get to, get to know uh, closely people mm. who you're going to spend the rest of your the four years with, you're going to have classes with them mm -hmm. and you get to find some really incredible people in those classes. I have uh, really gotten to know a lot of other uh, majors but I really, there's something that tells me that we're kind of more closely knit mm -hmm. and uh, more in tune with each other major than some other uh, fields of study, maybe. So English majors dig other English majors. Yes. That's what you're saying. <laughs> uh, Tyler. I mean, we all know who the poets are, who the theorists are, and those we don't uh, within a, within the group we don't see those as separations so much as you know we respect those differences mm -hmm. that you know like even though I'm obsessed with theory, you know I know who the poets are and you know and I see them as having I don't want to say a gift I don't have, but um, we have a profound respect for each other's. Mm -hmm talents and you know we see those differences as unifying us within one space mm -hmm. if we're in the same class with each other and we have some sort of large project we can go around the room and probably have some idea of what each of us are going to do it on mm -hmm. because we know what our passions are oh, absolutely. right absolutely. now uh, one of the ways i try to talk about the uh, experience um, in our courses is that we're trying to become vehicles for joy and passion um, in relationship to uh, thinking differently about our identities, our social commitments in the world, uh, and so forth. Um, if, when you leave here, for example, in what way do you think the joy and passion, because clearly you're, you're speaking so 
um, compellingly and enthusiastically about these experiences. How will that joy and passion translate, do you think, into uh, what you're going to be up to after you commence, which is in two or three weeks? So, um, what, in what ways can you either harness or utilize as tools, do you think, some of these skills and um, insights and so forth in terms of your life in the world post-commencement? Tyler? My answer to that is going to be in personal relationships, and I qualify that because one thing um, everyone that knows me knows that I talk quite often about the differences I see in people here and back home that I work with academics and use a certain upright language when I'm here and the things I talk about and the people I'm with back home in, in the agricultural setting are different and, and I don't you know I don't have a preference for one or the other um, but you know I know I won't have the same kind of academic involvement at home so I, I can't claim to have that but you know the joy and passion I, I see that come out with the personal relationships I have here and the one similarity but everywhere I go is is um, holding on to personal relationships um, and so I might I can't say I will be exactly passionate about the same things all the time but I will bring the same passion to the relationships I have with people right because language in is a vehicle through which we sustain and enhance our relationships. There has to be a choreography or a language oh, very much. Uh, to do so. Um, what, what will you be up to, Tyler? Are you planning on a career in agriculture? Mm -hmm. Are you still open to other possibilities? Or um, Yes, I'm planning on a career in agriculture and I, my dream, and this, this is just a dream at this point, um, that in a realistic sense is 10 or 15 years away, but my dream is to go back to my home farm and be an organic dairy farmer. Um, there's a very, very long and difficult road between here and there, um, financially in terms of family relationships and a lot of things that have to be sorted out. So my immediate plan is to seek employment in uh, with an organic creamery or some kind of organic farming support system to right. find a place there so that I can gain professional experience so that someday down the road when I do go home, you know, uh, my, my father and I won't have to like make a whole lot of expensive mistakes, you know, I will have the professional knowledge to be able to, to make a, a, a smooth transition between conventional and organic farming. Right. So that's, that's my path. Perhaps, perhaps what we've given you is this sort of surplus value of still being able to dream. Because yes. that, that, was, that was very powerful for me. Uh, Matt? Um, before I start talking about this, I just want to clarify, it was dialogue with unreason that Foucault talked about. I just equate unreason um, with Foucault to the absurd with Camus, so right. that was where I made right. that mistake. But, and, this, and this becomes relevant later in what I'm saying, <laughs> so I'm not just correcting The myself. dialogue of unreason, so wait for it. <laughs> right. um, to start with, when it comes to joy and passion, there's a Calvin and Hobbes comic strip that stuck with me ever since I first read it. Did you ever read Calvin and Hobbes? It was a Sunday comic strip. I'm, I'm so familiar with the strip. name, but I'll have yeah. to cultivate boy, boy, that one. Boy and his imaginary, maybe, tiger. <laughs> um, and uh, basically, so Calvin's in a classroom and the teacher is doing math problems, says, if anyone has any questions, we'll move on. He raises his hand, I have a question. What's the purpose of existence? And she says, I meant about the task at hand. And he's like, oh. Frankly, I'd like to get that figured out before we do any more on this. <laughs> and he, and he, in, the, in the joke, in the joke here is he's a first grader. Perfect. Um, so, but that's something that I definitely struggled with for a very, very long time. And junior year in high school, when I first, when we read *Grapes of Wrath*, and I first started thinking about a career as an English teacher, um, for me that was kind of the first step towards realizing. Uh, answering that question of, you know, why are we here and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then ever since then, all the English classes I've taken, especially in philosophy classes too, we've discussed stuff that is relevant to that mm -hmm. and has helped me make sense of it and think about it. And I've, and like, I've never been happier, honestly. Wow. Like ever since high, sc high school, I was not a very happy person. Graduating college, I'm, I just absolutely love life. That's why I want to be a teacher. I want to go out and I want to make other people happy too. I want them to people struggling with the same questions I did with, I want to give them some tools or resources to work yes. through that. Um, so for me, the joy and the passion comes from just 
English taught me what I love to do, and it taught me a way that I could just generally spread it around all over the place to other people. Preach it, brother. So, You're preaching to the choir. A, a teaching is one of the highest, I think, human uh, callings. Because you're allowed to, in some way, uh, inspire students to be able to dream, uh, to be able to experience uh, complexity as, a, as an invitation and not as a closed door and so forth. Um, and it works. It brings satisfaction, just as you're saying. Uh, Will? Um, no matter what career path you choose, um, I think the core of what we learned here in the English department is critical thinking. And that is something that is applicable to any sort of situation, uh, be it scientific or something involving business planning or something more creative. Like it's it's going to come up and listen up people <laughs> and we are we you are in that just way speaking my language in here. that way we've become jacks of all trades really <laughs> okay so, mm -hmm. it, so it's a universal language yeah. and pr from a personal standpoint uh i think because i was an english major and had a background in that sort of stuff i was able to get an internship with npr and so that is kind of got me more interested in paths in journalism and broadcasting and media and stuff like that so, Are you currently casting out a line? I am casting that? out all over the place. Uh, what would be a preferable venue for you to, say, an entry-level position? What are you dreaming about? Uh, some sort of... Uh, probably... That's a good question. <laughs> uh, something where I get to work either with other creative people or, if anything else, uh, journalism where I just get to go out and really see what the world is through it is and but the big part of that is translating it and showing that to other people that's oh. where having that audience is really where the passion lies to miss uh, as you project yourself out into the sort of post St. John's and St. Ben's horizon I have to say two things um The first being, I will spend the first probably three months after graduation reveling over the fact that I will never have to pull an all-nighter again writing an essay. <laughs> but then after that, I know for a fact I will miss it because there is something about, I mean, being tired and fatigued and worn out and... The blinking cursor. The blinking <laughs> cursor continues <laughs> to pulsate. Pulsating. And it's... Um, yes, with a capital R. I, so, like I said, at first I will not miss that, but I know I will very much grow to miss the antagonism, the, you know, something, you know, pushing me to keep going. Um, but something that I will miss right away and forever and always is, again, going back to the, the little community of graduating English majors we have is conversations with them. I mean, they're the greatest people I've ever met. And even though I don't, you know... Um, spend you know every waking hour with all of them right you know the profound cultivating conversations we have in class and especially out of class i mean even you know when we see each other at the bar we end up having these english major conversations right um and you know even though the farm has so much to offer me it's it's a, it's a life i look forward to forever you know i will forever miss um the people here that kind of network mm -hmm. uh, matt hmm uh, yeah, Tyler kind of said it all, honestly. I'll miss the classes. I'll miss, I'll, I'll miss the professors a lot. The professors here, I haven't had a single bad teacher since coming to St. John's. Every one of my English professors especially has been just great. Oh, I mean, I'm, and I'm not just pandering to you here, oh, of course. <laughs> But I'll, I'll miss that. I'll miss all of that, and I'll miss. We love teaching, and you know that. Yeah, <laughs> we love our yeah. students as well. And and I'll miss being here at school, and you know the trees, and running into a deer once in a while mm -hmm. in the early morning or evening. But I will miss the people a lot. Mm -hmm. um, just talk. It's it's like how I said. You start talking to them, and suddenly you just you keep talking to them, and you don't mm -hmm. ever stop. And then the next time you see them, it's a continuation of what you were saying before, or something completely different. It's just. English majors can talk a lot if they want to, and it's just a lot of fun getting to know people and talking to them. And 
yeah, I'll miss the people. We have some a lot. interesting, interesting students. Uh, Will, um, I know possibly the biggest um, value that they try to strive for here at St. John's is community, and they definitely, from my experience, have achieved that. Uh, I'm going to miss the discussions, the constant, constant discussions with other people about things we love, other people who are just as impassioned about it as I am. Like I'm. I'm not saying that it's going to end, but this is like going to be the high point, and it'll never be this pure again. I think. Uh, yeah, professors as well. Um, going in to college, you kind of have this view of what professors are going to be like. Like, <laughs> like, like what Matt said earlier. Like they're going to kick my ass. That's like what they're here for. But it's everyone is so helpful and really becomes a part of your life and you know they're they're the people who shape you oh my um well i'm virtually speechless uh, after those testimonials but um you know i think in triads oh, you sometimes kick our ass i should <laughs> clarify <laughs> uh truth in disclosure uh, so I, I i do think in triads so here is going to be the most difficult question as we uh, bring the our conversation to a close. Uh, I want you to try and summon up three words <laughs> uh, that to you would create a kind of set of associations that you will bring with you as you gaze up at the, um, at the commencement ceremony in thinking about your experience as an English major. Th three words. And I'd like for you to then simply articulate those words out loud for us. <laughs> you have to give explanations and why or just say the words? No, just the words. All right. This will resonate. This will be your... May we use contractions? You may use contractions. All right. <laughs> Those are words. <laughs> oh, this is <laughs> Two words. That's not even one word per year I've been here. Can you... Three words that you will associate uh, with your experience as an English major. Zizek. Essays. Um, literature. That's what Thank we do. You. Thank you. Matt? <clears throat> it's never done. Wow. <laughs> How am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> you just did it. Uh, Will? <sighs> Significance. Relevance. Bond. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, uh, we have spent our, uh, these lovely moments with uh, three of our distinguished graduates in the class of 2013, uh, Tyler Speltz, uh, Matt Joyle, uh, and Will Moore. And thank you, gentlemen, so much. Um, I value your voices and your experiences.